And good evening, everybody. So here we go. This is, I think, our fourth session on the Reformation. And tonight we're going to take a shift when we, um, we teach this um, to our students or, you know, for years, certainly when I had this in college, the Reformation is often taught in um, really like two phases, I guess you would say, the philosophical discussions that we've been having about what did Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and the rest uh, really think, um, but then also then you shift to what happens geopolitically in, um, in the moment of when um, the, the national interest begins to, to take hold. And I think that's one of the things that I've tried to emphasize with my students and I want to emphasize with you as well. When you hear the phrase wars of religion, it, it certainly doesn't sound good. Most of us, you know, do not like war. Um, and to think of a war about what we in, you know, the 21st century and probably for the past 200 years have believed to be my personal business, my private uh, issues, we find that very frustrating and distressful. And, and depending on one's own view of religion in general or Christianity in specific, you can, you know, draw to perhaps a negative conclusion and get frustrated and I would just offer instead that we have to put this idea of the philosophical moving into the physical or the political in its long historical context. And part of that context is the fact that um, really throughout all of history, the idea of a geographical place having a, a spiritual or philosophical religious view and that view deeply embedded into the society is the historical norm. So no matter where you go, if you go to Asia, if you go to Africa, if you uh, go to South America, North America, tribal peoples, organized peoples, um, traveler, hunter-gatherers, um, people who are uh, settled peoples, you see this all the time that there is a belief of something beyond what we can see in the physical and that belief impacting their, their civic structure. Or to say it differently, many of them, if they came out of the ground today, would look at us and just be curious and say, well, then how or why would you not want the influence of your spiritual um, in your decision making. And we have an answer for that. And that answer comes in this season. For Western civilization, the move to adopting the concept that there should be a separation between church and state, and that um, the move to believing that religion or, or philosophical views that one holds can be or should be their own private business all begins here. And, and we've seen some of that already. So you remember when we talked about the Anabaptists and Munster, or when we left off, Calvin was in Geneva, or what was happening in England, and we didn't really get through the story of what happens after Elizabeth secures the throne. We will in coming days, um, coming sessions. But in all those moments, as you remember, what did the Northern Renaissance provide for us? The Northern Renaissance provided this this um, situation in which mystically, in mysticism, I could um, have my own interaction with the divine, with the beyond, without the necessary oh. interface of a structure. Richard. And, and so in, in that setting, then one could see how easily it, it splits into the different strands. So that's what we believe now, but that is not gonna be just magically accepted in this season. Instead, there's gonna to continue to be um, the tension as we see an increased accumulation of power in larger and larger civic areas. So geographic areas becoming what we call nations will demand to some level a common sense of a religion. And so there's going to be a struggle over that. As you can imagine, 
between those who want to lead the civic structure. So, that, so if they want to lead that structure, at least as they understood the world in the 14 and 15 and into the 1600s, you must be able to um, speak to the religion. And in fact, if you can, where we're going to end up, not today, but where we will end up in three or four class days is the middle of the 1600s. And if you can remind yourself that that's the very moment that the American experience is really taking root with Jamestown and the Pilgrims and the Puritans, and then following that into the latter 1600s, what the United States begins, or what would be called the United States, begins to express is maybe there is a way for a people to live in a geographical construct within a civic society and yet have the freedom to express themselves religiously, whether privately or as part of a named group, and yet those two things do not have to be in conflict. So the idea that we hold really important in our, in our society as a freedom of religion, you know, the whole First Amendment, that idea and what that means of a separation of church and state, that's all going to be born in, in, in the early stages of being fleshed out in the United States in the backdrop or within the backdrop of what's happening in Europe, where they're still fighting over that idea. The ones who found the United States, to some degree, are the refugees from this struggle. And as they come over, they're either passionate about their faith, but unwilling to necessarily go to war with somebody over it, or they're dispassionate about faith, and they just want to go someplace where they don't have to be pushed into a corner. And that becomes this founding. So, so you think about today, we're really, as we're talking about the wars of religion, we're really setting the stage for why would there be the specific people who come over to the United States, all right? So we're gonna do a little recap, kind of get ourselves moving. We have at least three, if not four more sessions, depends on how much I wanna do with England, um, to kind of move through and kind of wrap this all up as we go forward. But what we're really noticing is that, that we are going to see this shift. And at, at the root of the pressure comes the fact that the leading Protestant faith will be, at this point, mid-1500s, will be the Calvinist. And the, the Catholics will have moved into their counter-reformation phase. So these two groups, the Jesuits representing the Catholic counter-reformation and the Calvinists representing a... a um, uh, a reform-minded protesting group that is, is equally activist. These two are going to clash, and that clash is going to reverberate throughout most of Europe. So here we're going to back up. This is Europe as we saw it kind of rolling into this time period, into the Renaissance. You see even in Old Gaul and certainly on the Iberian Peninsula, all the different minor kingdoms, They're using the word kingdom, um, that would have been an okay term to use, but you can see there in Central Europe, all this orange here in the middle is misleading because it suggests that there was one thing when really uh, Central Europe had uh, upwards to 200 to maybe 300 independent nations kind of operating <clears throat> there in Central Europe. So what we've noted, just kind of running quickly, we've done some of this, is the Hundred Years' War ends both in England and in France. They fight a civil war. The French Civil War, well, really the English Civil War too, plays a part of the conclusion of the Hundred Years' War. So really through most of the 1400s, while England and France, quote unquote, fought a war with each other, within England and within France, the dynastic families are struggling. And again, as a reminder, this is vital for you to think in terms of at this um, point in time, it, it's still really inaccurate to talk about like the French or like the Germans. Like right now as we're watching the coronavirus, we're told that Germany's about to reopen or, or there's discussions, you know, Sweden as a place did not close down. And we watch the Swedes and we watch the Germans and we think of them in this kind of monolithic way. And if we flew over there today and we landed, they would recognize the term being, you know, you're a German or you're a Swede. But at this structure, at this point, the 1400s, that's not how they would have seen it. They wouldn't have understood that terminology. Um, what 
what was the ruling at this point is now we're a thousand years into the feudal system, which is at its root of familial control, right? So imagine a really wealthy family in the United States buying up more and more and more land. We know we have excessively wealthy people in our country, but they typically, they might buy some nice things here and there, but you don't see Bill Gates buying up Seattle, right? We, we can't imagine that he would be able to, to own Seattle, right? But he could, right? He's worth billions. If he wanted to, he could. And that was the land, when you look at Europe, all the places you and I think of as, as kingdoms really were more the land owned by a family. So there's always more than one family in the dynastic struggle, either related, so cousins, you know, three or four generations back up, or just other powerful families. So in England and in France, during this period, there's a civil war, there's a civil war after, we saw the English civil war last time and how that led to the coming of the Tudor family. In France, they fight one between the ruling family, the Valois family, and the, at that time, the, the leading other family from the House of Burgundy. And so they'll go through, there's a whole civil war fought. Uh, what Burgundy's attempting to do, I think I've got a map here, here is they're attempting to recreate um, the central kingdom of Charlemagne. Um, so Mr. Van Horn and I were talking about Charlemagne and he put me onto a really nice documentary on Amazon. And so when Charlemagne dies in, eight, in the early 800s, his kingdom is split. And his oldest son was given this central land right here. His oldest son, his name is Lothar, and it's from Lothar that we'll end up with one of these little spots right here being known as Lorraine. And if you know your World War I, World War II history, then you know that term. You've heard of that place. It's right near the Rhine River, so it was really kind of important. The Burgundians were attempting to recreate Lothar's king, at least the upper part, the part north of the Alps. Lothar had all the way through the Italian peninsula. And that doesn't go well for them. So, so they'll lose in 1477. The Valois family comes out on top, just like the Tudor family came out on top in England. Meanwhile, down in Iberia, they've been going through their own thing. So here's this map down here. You can see the kingdom of Castile and the kingdom of Aragon. They ultimately are able to control most of Iberia they marry very famously, of course, as we know, in 1492. That's the same time that Christopher Columbus and the explorers are trying to go and find a way to Asia. And so Columbus goes to meet Isabella of Castile, gets her permission and her support, and he takes off after she and Ferdinand of Aragon decide to marry. So we have this moment where the Iberian kingdoms join a marriage, they complete the Reconquista of 1492, and ultimately, they're in a position to create Spain. So as you go into the 1500s, you do have an England, you have a France, you have a Spain kind of making their way through. We'll come back to this in a moment. Um, and, and so you can kind of be in this spot where there's, the, the, if you wanted to, the three leading families. We saw this last time. I'll show you a slide in a second is the Tudor family in England, the Valois family in France, and of course the, the most powerful family are the Habsburgs. Well, the Habsburgs have been in control of the Holy Roman Empire for at this point 300 years or so. They joined the Valois family in fighting the Burgundian Wars. So when that ended, they got part of the spoils. What the Habsburg get is this upper part here, the Low Countries. You, of course, you can see that on the map. That's the Netherlands over there. There's Belgium over here. There's Luxembourg down here. That goes to the Empire side. But they also got the daughter of, of the last um, Duke of Burgundy, Mary. And Mary is married to Maximilian, who will become the Holy Roman Emperor before Charles V. Uh, Carol, or somebody mentioned the video that I showed you two or three weeks ago, and you may remember there's a scene in there where it talks about how Maximilian was before Charles. Okay, anyway, um, so how this sets in motion, if you look at these two charts, so here you can see the Spanish side of the story, and here in the more uh, tan, <clears throat> tan, you can see the uh, Germanic or the Habsburg side of the story, and so Maximilian will marry Mary, and here you can see, um, 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 then, he, then they have a son named Philip. And Philip will marry Joanna, 
of Castile. So here's Joanna, the daughter of Isabel and Ferdinand, and then there's Philip. And through them, they will have Charles V. And we've covered this before because I pointed out to you that Charles V is the aunt of Catherine of Aragon, who we see married England and Henry VIII. So it's all interwoven, right? And all of this, particularly the Civil War with the uh, Burgundians and the outcome of that, sets in motion where we're headed, right? So behind the religious side of it, there's this political side, which is what I'm trying to help kind of lay the groundwork for here. One, the Habsburgs and the Valois families will get into it over Italy, which I'll show you in a second. And two, as we saw last time, the English story that Tudor families attempt to control and then what happens with Henry is all related to kind of how things went with his marriage with Catherine. So in Italy, which we were, were in during the, the Renaissance, so this is still a part of the Renaissance time, as these city-states, Milan, Venice, Florence in particular, Siena to a smaller degree, Rome as a part of the papal states, all went through the Reformation. They gained in power, they gained in wealth, and as they gained in wealth and influence, they began to jockey for control. And you can see from Naples down here in the south, Sicily to a lesser degree, all the way up here to Milan, to Venice, there's this struggle between these major um, places, nations, and they go at it. Well, in 1494, Milan made the interesting choice to appeal to France for aid. At the same time that Spain, Aragon in particular, and Ferdinand was attempting to expand Spanish control of the Mediterranean. And ultimately, as you can see here on this map, was in control of Sicily. He eventually became in control of Naples. And so, you begin, this is where you have the Habsburg Valois Wars over, really over Italy, but it's over who will be the dominant power in the region. And if you remember your story of the Franks, Charlemagne's peoples, the Franks, eventually France, and Christianity in the papacy have had a very tight and yet complicated relationship. So it's not just the land of Italy that was a piece of the puzzle but the faith itself. All right, so pressing forward. So here's our map. We saw this last time. As we roll into the 1500s, an interesting thing happens in which the leaders of these three families were all young. So Henry VIII, when he becomes the king in 1509, is 18. Three years before that, when, I'm sorry, six years later, when the Valois king shifts to the next, next king, it's the Francis, and he's 21. And then four years after that, Charles V. So these guys are all in their 20s. They all have, they know each other. There's this relationship between them. So this is kind of playing in through the Reformation period. So there's this geopolitical happening while the religious is happening. And of course, we know in 1517, between the coming of Francis and the coming of Charles is when Luther emerges on the scene with his 95 Theses. So this is where we left, we saw previously this, the kind of growth of Christianity and the, the kind of challenge of, of, the, of how this would be worked out in the empire itself. And it is in the empire itself that we see the first of the wars. And we covered this before. You remember us talking about the Capel Wars in Switzerland, this is the one where Zwingli is killed. That's why we don't really hear anybody talk about Zwingliism. There's no first church of Zwingli in, you know, Maitland or, or Orlando. <clears throat> the Protestants will be able to defend themselves within the kingdom, primarily because um, Charles is busy. Partially he's busy in his rivalry with the Valois, so those Valois wars are going on, but he's also pressured from the coming of the Ottomans, um, who had pressed across Constantinople into the Balkans and were pushing up. And two or three times over the next hundred years, they will, they'll threaten Vienna. And Vienna will, it is a dicey moment. They don't threaten Vienna necessarily at this juncture, but still, it keeps Charles busy. And so he's not able to really focus, which is another one of the key reasons why Luther and then the other reformers are able to be successful in this time when the other reformers who we, we mentioned previously were not, in, in previous centuries, were not. 
So as the Reformation spreads, we saw again um, two times ago, two, two sessions ago, how in 1545 the Council of Trent was called, initially a moderation stance, but as we saw over the next 15 to 20 years, kind of leads to the coming of a more strident position defending Catholicism and willing to do what necessary, both in education, but also in you know, military action. Luther dies in 46, and so then that kind of removes one of the strongest moderating voices. It is at this moment that Charles thinks he has one last chance. Um, he's certainly older now, and for that time period, he's really in the latter part of his life, and he knows it. He's able to secure a peace with France for a short while, and as you can see, the very next year with the Ottomans. So he goes at it. He, he kind of puts together the Imperial Army and tries to go after the Lutherans. Now, by this point, when we say go after the Lutherans, he's not trying to go find churches or individual Lutherans and, and somehow make them recant or change their position. We're talking about the various leaders within the empire. So as you remember, so did that map a minute ago, the empire is not one thing. It's not even, you know, five or six things. It's like 300 things. So trying to convince them involved a military show of force, either showing up to an imperial free city or showing up on the borders of some place like Saxony or Hesse or the Palatinate and threatening them with war. And so ultimately in 47, a new round of conflict in the, in the central part of Europe breaks out in the empire and Charles is successful. But we notice something. His success allowed him to replace two of the leaders, which is what it was going to take. But you remember what we saw last time we were looking at Mary? We noticed that when Mary took over the throne after the, the, the death of her, her younger brother, Edward, that it had been about 25 or 30 years since Henry VIII had made his decisions to break with Rome. Her attempt to bring Catholicism back in was met with conflict, was met with opposition. Not total opposition. There were several in England who would have been happy to become Catholic again. But enough opposition that she was not able to move freely. She had to buy off the nobles by letting them keep land that Henry had given them. And she ultimately started putting people to the stake. And it didn't go well, right? So that's one of the key things that she and Charles will both discover is that by 30 years later, people have grown accustomed to what they've experienced. And so now, whether it was Calvinist lands or whether it was like in Saxony, Lutheran lands, the people did not want to go back to being Catholic. So even though he put new Catholic rulers, those rulers had the same experience as Mary, where there was lots of opposition. By 52, the war is back. The, 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 the Lutheran kingdoms are able to unite in a way, and eventually, by this point, even Charles can see this, this is not going well. So he recognizes this is not going to end, and then really, I think, just kind of a desperate kind of exhaustion, and I always feel sorry for Charles. Charles, I think, is a tragic figure. He didn't sign up for this. He wasn't attempting to to, to do anything with Catholicism, and he was 19. I always think about my students when I, when I teach about Charles because, and myself, I mean, at 19, I mean, you know, we like to think of ourselves maybe in good positive ways, but having worked with enough 19 year olds, I'm sure I was the same way, where it's like, wow, I would have not, I would not have wanted to be in charge. The most powerful man in the world, that's what he was, handed it an empire. So really, really tough. And so he abdicates. He splits his empire, and here's how he splits it. You can see it. I'll go back to the slide in a minute. Where he gives his son, Philip, control of what you can see there in the purple. And he gives his brother, Ferdinand, control of the empire. The specific in yellow was the direct controlled lands, but everything inside the purple lines was also his. So in one sense, the brother, Ferdinand, and the son, Philip, would have to work together. So the Hatford lands are split. Now, this will actually make Philip the most powerful person in Europe, because as you can see from the little box up there, by this point, the Habsburgs, the Spanish, had pretty much circumnavigated the globe and were beginning to reap the benefits of control, 
of the wealth from the Aztecs, from India, from um, Southeast Asia. So they're very successful. But Charles decided he just can't handle it. He will orchestrate the final piece of Augsburg. So Augsburg becomes an important place here within the Lutheran story. And we'll conclude that whatever the leader wishes to do will be allowed. And so this is a little bit of a moderated stance. Now, you and I would still be unhappy with that because what if I'm a Lutheran in a Catholic land or what if I'm Catholic in a Lutheran land? And then most importantly, notice that neither Calvinism nor the Anabaptists are allowed to be a choice. So what if I'm those guys? And this actually sets off a lot of mass migration across the empire as people in whole churches fled. But, but it, it, was, it, was a, it was moderate for Charles. And he will leave, he'll actually go back to Spain where he lived as a boy and join a monastery and will live three more years in quiet isolation, leaving all this to his son and his brother. For now, the Peace of Augsburg will allow for the tensions to dissipate in Central Europe, except the Calvinists, the most militant group, are not included. And remember, at this point, the Swiss Alps, the cantons in Switzerland, are a part of the empire. Again, here's, here's the map. So, you know, here's, here's Switzerland right here. So it, it, it's dicey, right? There's going to be some frustration. That frustration is going to spill out into the rest of Europe, but most specifically into France, which is where we're going to spend the rest of our, our time tonight. You can see that when we leave Europe and consider moving to the rest of Europe, you now have these four groups, which we've talked about already, so I won't repeat it all to you. But you can also see the coming of a northern Germany separated from a southern Germany, and this is going to play a role 200 years later, no, I'm sorry, 300 years later, when the Germans finally unite into Germany, and this is why Austria, one of the reasons why Austria is not included in that, which has lots of ramifications for what happens in the 20th century. Okay, so now we're going to go to France because we've kind of set this in motion as to kind of how we get there. In this moment, you can see all these key leaders that we just introduced, they pass on. So Francis, Luther, Henry, Charles, they all die. And so we're kind of moving into this new phase. Unfortunately for France, when Francis dies, the Valois family is not going to be its strongest. His son will be okay, but that son will not be able to leave behind a strong subsequent child, which, which we're about to see as we kind of go through the process. It is that tension of who will be in control, and this is true in all the lands, that will lead us to war, and the bloodiest of them will be in France. So here we can see another map, just kind of point out some of the pieces to you. Notice in France how there's these kind of lines of Calvinism that are spreading along the rivers, and this becomes a key um, element of what's going to happen in Old Gaul as the different major um, no, ro, uh, noble families will contend with one another. Now, one of the pieces that's happening at this point is that the Valois family, since the Hundred Years' War, has been attempting to um, knit together, we might say, um, control. Francis's grandfather was Louis XI. He's known as the Spider King. Um, he's about 20, 30 years after um, the, the end of the Hundred Years' War, and he's nicknamed the Spider King because he's spinning a web over the old feudal old Gaul to knit it together into this new thing that would be understood as the kingdom of France, right? That there's a thing called France. In 1559, the war between the Habsburgs and the Valois family ends um, with the Peace of Chateau Chambray, and this will allow for that tension to emerge in the center of France. The new king, Henry II, of course, he's the one that brings the peace, he recognizes that he's got two problems. One is 
this coming of the Reformation. So remember, Calvin was French, remember? And so not surprisingly, he's going to be sending Reformation ideals back. His very famous book we talked about, the Institutes, um, they will be um, um, put into French. Um, he will be the one who puts the Bible into French. So now we're seeing again this idea of language. Remember in England, Wycliffe, and then more importantly, Tyndall puts the Bible into English. In Germany, it's Luther himself who puts the Bible into, into German. And in France, Calvin will be central in the, in the um, writing of the Bible, translating the Bible into French. So not surprisingly, it's flowing. It's not a huge percentage, about 10%. Of the, of the citizens of France who are adopting Calvinism, which in France, he gets the nickname of Huguenot, which is a weird kind of name. And it's, 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 it's complicated. And quite actually, it's so complicated, it's not worth, and it's a minor issue. But when you see the word Huguenot on the slides, it's the French version of Calvinism, right? But even though it's only 10%, it's about two fifths of the nobility. It's not really clear if there was just some Christian revival happening amongst the nobility, which is possible, or if they were just attracted to the philosophical leanings of Calvin, they would have been the most learned, most uh, average people would not have gone to schooling of any sort. So perhaps they're the ones reading Calvin and they're interested in that from a humanistic point of view. For the major noble families, it's all though about power and control, just like we saw in Germany with the, the you know, the Duke of Saxony. So, there are three major families below the Valois family, once the Burgundians were gotten rid of. That's the family of Bourbon, the family of Guise, and the family of Montmorency. And you can see there where they're laid. I'm going to back up to this map just for a second. So the, the Guise family is more central around Paris and to the east. The Bourbon family is down here, Navarre. You see here Henry of Navarre. Um, at this point, not Henry of Navarre, but uh, Anthony of Navarre, but that Navarre is this right here, right? So right here near the Pyrenees in the northern corner of Spain and this part here, lower part here, so you can see how, how, how much the Calvinist Huguenot are there. And the Montmorency are up here more in the north. They don't, they have, they don't have as strong a holding as the other two families, uh, but around Normandy, that's one of the places where they're located in this general area up here. So for the Bourbon family, they have almost 100% become Huguenot. The Guise family is 100% Catholic and more than that, Counter-Reformation Catholic. The Montmorency family, they're kind of split, maybe 60, 40, 60% staying within the Catholic tradition. All three of these families considered the kingdom as a potential prize for themselves. So don't look at what they're doing as some kind of a traitorous act against the king. It's one rich family trying to out buy another. Much like today, we see Apple and Amazon and Google sometimes going at it, trying to buy some new, hip, cool, young uh, company on the rise that's got a new technology. And they're competing with each other. You know, you don't see Apple going, oh, wait, that's involving books and shipping. We'll leave that to Amazon or Amazon saying, oh, well, it involves uh, searching. So we'll leave that to Google, right? They're always looking to take over each other. And I guess at some level, if you could get in their heads, you would imagine all those major companies that are out there, players uh, in the world today, probably would just love to be the only option and the others just disappear. Um, of course, they're too rich and powerful for that to happen, much like here. Uh, they're too rich and powerful for that to happen, but they're always competing. So they're not thinking, oh, the king is on his throne. They're thinking the Valois family has had control for some time, but that doesn't mean they can keep control. And we might be next in line. And the Bourbon family was next in line. However, the Guise family was probably more powerful. If you went to war, the Guise family would have been the strongest. The current Duke of Guise at that part was the, the leading French general. Uh, two of his brothers were the major cardinals of the faith, uh, one in Paris and really one for, quite honestly, all of, all of France. So you can imagine that they had a lot more influence and power involved in this struggle. But they also were jealous of each other. So on the one hand, they would all be united and wanting to replace the Valois family. And at the same time, they would all distrust each other because not wanting anybody else to get ahead. So this leads to a really complicated relationship 
of you know geopolitical intrigue and political machinations are kind of working its way around. Here's another way of looking at the map, and you can see um, how there's kind of this string of, of um, churches and congregations all down here in the south near the land of the Navarre area, up here a little strong around uh, around Normandy. So where the Montmorency are kind of very little here. There's a little bit of dots through here, but in general, you can see the central area where the Guise family was, not very much at all. All right. Unfortunately for the Valois family, Henry, who probably would have been a decent king, died in a tournament. And of course, this was a thing the royal players did. They, they went on these jousting, and he, he was jousting, and a splinter flew into his eye. Um, which today you might lose your eye, but you probably could be saved. Back then, that was ultimately going to be fatal. So he dies. His sons are young and by all accounts, sickly, not well. So a couple of instances of mental health issues amongst them. And so this takes us to his wife, who he, well, uh, I was going to say he didn't really love her necessarily, um, but it was a very important marriage in that you can see a name you may recognize, the de' Medici family. And so you remember when we did our work with the, Re uh, the Renaissance, we found ourselves studying that the de' Medici's were really the most powerful family in, in Florence. And to some degree, the de' Medici's were the most powerful family in all of Italy. And so we're not, you should be surprised to see the, a de' Medici uh, here as the wife of the queen of France. And then you shouldn't be surprised because of the de' Medici tradition, Machiavelli in particular, to realize that Catherine was a player. She was not a passive sit at home. She was another one of the many strong women that we know existed throughout all of you know, human history. And she went to work to try to navigate the tricky waters of protecting her sons and their control of the throne so that the name, the Valois families control the lands and at the same time, keeping these three powerful families at bay. And she would do her very best for her total life, all of her life, till she died, in trying to negotiate this. And to some degree, you can say she did a really good job. Now, she does some things that we'll see in a minute are not the best type of things to have done, um, but she does them, and she does them pretty well. So it's kind of interesting in the process. Um, her son, the oldest son, Francis, takes the throne, becomes Francis II, he's 14. Catherine would be his regent, but the person who had the most influence for Francis is the Duke of Guise. So because he's the Duke of Guise, this is something that doesn't, you know, bode well for the Bourbon family, who theoretically is second in line. So now you have the king die young. Now he's got four sons. So theoretically, one of them should be able to live long enough, have, get married, have a child, and the Valois family could continue. But because they're young, as we saw in England, when those young sons died during the War of the Roses, now things get a little more dicey. And so there's an opportunity here for somebody who might want to make a play for control, including the Duke of Guise. So in the story, in March of 1560, there's an attempt to kidnap the king. And this was led by both factions of the Bourbon family and the Protestant side of the Montmorency family. It's discovered. Duke of Guise saves the day, uh, executes everybody. There was a desire to execute uh, um, Anthony of Navarre, and Catherine won't let that happen because she realizes, again, she's got to be careful, and she doesn't want the Guise family to get too much influence. So now, for a moment, the Guise family will be in, on top. But... As you can see, in December of that year, Francis dies. He was, again, sickly children. The children were not very healthy. So this means the second son. He's only nine. He's now the king. Again, Catherine is the regent, and she's got to try to navigate this story. Now, she now is aware that the Duke of Guise considers himself really the most powerful person in France, not the king. And so she tries to mediate that. Along the way in 1562, the Duke of Guise, again, feeling no compunction or compulsion that he needs to ask anybody's permission, is rolling through uh, uh, basically west of Paris, you know, south of, of Normandy, so somewhat near the lands of the Montmorency family. And he just happens to come upon a congregation worshiping at Vassy. 
and he kills them all. In this moment here with the, the, the massacre at Vassy is really what kicks off what we would consider the wars of religion in France. Now again, here's the charts you can see. I'll slow down here for just a moment. Here's Louis XI, who I told you is the spider king. Down here is Francis, who we introduced ourselves to a couple of weeks ago. His son, Henry. And then now here are his children, all down through here. And his four sons are Francis, Charles, Henry, and yes, that's Francis again. Yeah, don't ask. It's just uh, we're going to keep some of the same names if we can, kind of a thing. All right, and two daughters, Elizabeth, who is married off to Philip of Spain, and Marguerite, who's married off to Henry, who we'll get to in a moment. All right, so Charles comes into his leadership over a decade of war and conflict. There's just kind of ongoing murder, war, some pitched battles, others just kind of maneuverings behind the scenes. As he ages, he begins to speak and think for himself, as you might imagine. And one of his close friends was one of the leaders of the Montmorency family, Coligny, who was the lead admiral for, for France, again, up there in Normandy. Coligny wanted to try to use his influence to hopefully keep his friend, Charles, on the throne. So he likes Charles now. He's, he's, he's older than Charles, but he, he likes him. Keep him on the throne. And he thought the best way to do that would be to give the, the Guise and the Bourbon family something else to fight than each other. And to do that, the best option would be to go back to fighting the Habsburgs. Now let's pause for a moment. Next week, we're going to look more at what Philip does, but I can't go forward without giving you some of Philip. Now, so if you have questions like, wait, what about Philip or why did that happen? I promise you next week, we're going to go into detail on that. So I don't want to get stuck there, but just understand that once, remind yourselves of how after the, the failure in Munster in the 1530s for the Anabaptists, and then as um, Calvin secures control in Geneva and becomes like the central hub of the other iteration of the faith in Switzerland. That the Rhine River becomes like a highway and becomes this kind of central journey of people of the Protestant faith. So not surprisingly, at the top of our map, at the mouth, you end up in the Low Countries, modern-day Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. And so around those areas, there is a tremendous amount of, of growth of the Calvinist religion. But remember, the Peace of Augsburg did not allow those to be legal. And, it's being more complicated, and the Counter-Reformation is going on, and Philip had watched this thing really ruin his dad's life. So Philip is a counter-reformation believer. So the idea of there being some reformist in lands he directly controls, and even though the low countries are in the empire, remember the map with the purple and the orange, um, the purple lands left to the Spanish Habsburgs or to Philip include the low country. So the Spanish are involved in this story. So Coligny is thinking we should attack the Habsburgs, not so much to support the reformers, but just to deal with the Habsburgs, who by this point have surrounded France. Well, Charles is so sure, but Catherine thinks it's a terrible idea. She doesn't want to get into it. Now, one, because she's a Catholic herself, and she would not want to attack another Catholic. But two, she wants to try to keep all the families kind of at each other and therefore in her mind off of her sons and the Valois family. So 1572 comes and it's really one of the most influential years in French history. Charles and Catherine think we can try to work out some relationships and so the what they decide to do is to marry his sister Marguerite to the leading young man of the Navarre family, Henry. That's of the, Bo of the Bourbon family, right? But Henry of Navarre. And so in 1572, they have a plan to do this. 
Now, to this day, you can ask historians of the French, the, of the Reformation, of the world religion, and you're going to get some different stories about what really happened. So these dates I've got for you here in bold are, are, are certainly the dates things happened, but like who did what to whom is still not completely um, clearly understood. So St. Bartholomew's Day is a big celebration. And so there's going to be a big celebration anyway. And of course, Paris is the leading city as it is today. So it's going to have more people coming. But now they decided to make it a really big deal by having Henry and Marguerite get married. So yay, that's very good. And because it's Henry, there's going to be several Huguenots who openly come to the city. Paris had largely remained a pretty strictly Catholic city. So you don't have a lot of Huguenot congregations. But they all come to support Henry. And it's going to be happy and all this kind of stuff. Well, four days after the marriage, the marriage happens, four days after the marriage, there's an attempted assassination on the Admiral, on Coligny. This is where it gets murky. It's not really clear. What we think happened is that Catherine was jealous of the relationship and not wanting to go to war with the Spanish. She reached out to the Duke of Guise and said, hey, help me out here. And he, of course, was very happy to try to take out one of his leading rivals. Unfortunately, the assassination attempt went sideways and Coligny is not killed. He then gets back to Charles and says, hey, I was just, I'm wounded, I'm, I was attacked. And Charles, of course, immediately is furious in protecting his friend. He's like, wait, why, why'd that happen? He, you know, I don't, I don't want that to happen. Um, in the process, Charles goes to Catherine, his mom. She knows she's caught. And then in what must have been one of the most amazing displays of Machiavelli, she throws herself at her son's feet and says, it was me, I did it, but you don't understand. And it's kind of a whole mommy dearest kind of a mental game that she plays with her son, who of the three boys had had some mental instabilities along the way. When he hears this, he is endeared to his mother, who he loved, and she convinces him that there had been, an, it was going to be an attempt on his life by all these Huguenot Christians, these Protestants who had come to town, and to some degree, she sort of accuses Henry of Navarre, now the brother-in-law, but she really puts Coligny at the front of this. It's all him. That's why we tried to kill him. And in a mystery for many people, Charles believes her. It's one of the most fascinating moments in uh, you know, son-mom relationships in history that you could study. In any case, as you can see, two days later, the very infamous um, massacre uh, on St. Bartholomew's Day takes place, where thousands of people are murdered in the streets of Paris. At least 3,000 that we know of, it could be even higher. Word spreads immediately throughout the lands, um, certainly in central um, Gaul, but really all the way until you get down to the lands controlled by the Bourbon family, and at least another 20,000 are killed. And, you know, for some people uh, who study history and certainly people steeled in the tragedies of the 20th century, the murder or the death of 25-ish thousand people doesn't sound like a lot. But at the time, it's, it's, it's ranked right up there as one of the worst atrocities that was committed openly by sitting government. It wasn't somebody who just did this out of spite. This was the leaders of the, of the government. That fact will play a huge role in undermining support for the Valois family amongst people, particularly in Southern France. And the Southern French people will really lose support. And you'll begin to have a series of pamphleteers starting to write, raising questions about what does it mean for there to be a monarch of a, of a nation. Now this is about 60 years before um, Hobbes will write a very similar type philosophical treatise in England. So I'm someone who loves to talk, in fact, I'm doing this in one of my classes right now about Lobs, uh, Hock, Hobbes and Locke, Locke um, and their kind of role in England as being these two centerpieces of philosophical political theory and how critical they are for world history, and they are. Uh, but they were preceded in France in the moment of this 
St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and, and questions beginning to be raised of, well, what should a government of a people look like in a thing called a kingdom? Again, we're experiencing this question of what does it mean to be a nation? Well, the massacre just obviously causes a whole series of issues. Um, foreign forces, England, Germany, Switzerland, they all start getting involved. Uh, they send money and or troops, and the thing's really starting to spiral out of control. Two years later, Charles dies, and his brother, Henry, comes to the throne as Henry III. Now, he's older. He's 23 by this point, so Catherine's influence is limited. But this didn't stop the battle. In fact, Henry of Valois is caught between these other two leading thinkers. And as you can see, I always joke with my students on the first day of class when we're confronted with some really tough names. We're introduced to Tiglath Pileser and Nebuchadnezzar and uh, some of the other you know, names that you meet in antiquity. And they're complaining. And I'm like, well, just hang on. I'm going to get you to France before the course is over, and you're going to wish one of these guys was named Tiglath Pileser because then you'd recognize his name better. And we'll end up with what's known as the War of the Three Henrys. And actually, there were like four or five other leaders who were lesser than these guys who were also named Henry. So there's just all these Henrys that are everywhere, and they will be involved in this last stage. So we're almost done. So hang with me. We're almost finished. Henry is the weakest of the three. So these three, Henry of Valois, he's the weakest. Now, he also has some mental instabilities um, in the process. Henry of Navarre, Henry Duke of Guise, these guys are, are savvy and wily and, and charismatic and very resourceful in leading. And, and so France really, once again, goes into a deep civil war. 1576, Guise will organize what had become various disorganized groups of Catholic supporters into the Holy League. And the Holy League will begin a process of gaining control of the North. At this point, the Montmorency family is really um, kind of drifts off and out of the story. And it really becomes a Valois, Bourbon, Guise struggle in the process. Because the king is so weak and the Bourbon family and the Guise family are so strong, you even see certain regions beginning to have almost their own autonomy. And it's interesting to think what could have transpired had this continued. 84, Spain gets in the story again. Now, keep in mind, if you know your English history, which, again, we may get back to in one of our next three or four class meetings, the Spanish are getting really ready to launch the Spanish Armada in 1588. So Philip's already very deeply involved in northern Europe. And between England and the Low Countries, he's eager to get involved also with France. In Philip's mind, he's always just one step away from completing what his father couldn't complete, which is reuniting Europe. Remember, Charles V, the father of Philip, is named in honor of Charlemagne, who is the first, after the Roman collapse, to reunite Europe. So there's kind of this sense of Charles and now Philip trying to replicate that kingdom of Charles the, of, of Charlemagne. And he's always one piece away. He's just one thing that's going to comprise and stop him. And Philip comes really close. Remember, when Mary's the Queen of England in the 1540s, Philip's married to her. So in one sense, if they could have a son, then that would give him England, and now France would be completely surrounded. So here in the 1580s, He's got another shot at that um, through some other things in England, which we'll come touch on later, but also the fact that he's got an army up in the Low Countries fighting in this civil war. So they're eager to help the Holy League. And so 1585, the Duke of Guise pressures Henry III into this war, the War of the Three Henrys. Navarre and Guise, they're both aided by all these other people. There's Germans, there's English involved. Navarre successful in the south. That's Henry of Navarre of the Bourbon family. Henry, Duke of Guise, is successful in the north. It doesn't seem to be things are going anywhere, but Philip successfully suggests to Henry, Duke of Guise, they usually just take Paris. And if you've ever studied France before, and I think we've talked about this, remember last year we did the French Revolution, we talked about this. Paris in the a relationship with Old Gaul, to me, 
has an outsized influence that no other country can speak of. Rome to Italy does not have the same influence. London to England does not have the same influence. Berlin to Germany, Vienna to Austria or Vienna to, to Germany. They do not have the same influence that Paris has over Gaul, old Gaul. And so if you could control Paris, well, you could be maybe in control. So he invades Paris and seeks to uh, kidnap the king. And we're not sure if he wanted to kill Henry III or just use him as a puppet. We're not totally sure. But Henry, with his mom's help, you know, she loved her boys, um, successfully escapes. And he, of course, goes south to his brother-in-law, says he's sorry, he didn't mean to. And of course, Henry of Navarre is no dummy. And so here comes the king offering his support. So he's like, yeah, sure, I'll take your help. Come on in. And so now off we go, right? So the war continues. Between the May invasion and December, of course, the Spanish Armada goes sideways for Philip, yay for England, but then that's bad for Henry, Duke of Guise. It's good for Henry III. So he kind of bucks up and gets his courage and he orders the assassination, a successful assassination of Henry, Duke of Guise. Now Navarre's got his chance. Henry of Navarre and Henry III, they have a chance. They move on Paris, but of course, Spain comes to the rescue. Again, there's that army um, in, um, in, in the Low Countries. And so the army, and it's led by a guy, we'll meet him in the next class, Duke of Parma. Um, he's a very successful general. He saves Paris and is able to get there. In the meantime, Henry III is assassinated by a, not so much at Guise direction, but to defend the honor of the Guise family. So of the War of the Three Henrys, Henry III of Valois is gone, and Henry, Duke of Guise is gone. So that leaves just one Henry left. But the people don't want to receive him, and he's got to win Paris. So Henry recognizes something, which is what really sets him apart as we kind of move to this latter part of the 1500s, in that if the decisions of the other leaders could be interpreted, we would say, largely, that these are people operating at the best interests of their own family and their own personal views their own beliefs. Nobody was thinking about the people, generally speaking. Henry of Navarre recognizes that if he really wants to gain control of France, he cannot do it through warfare. He has to do it to appealing to Paris to see him as the rightful heir, because he was married to Marguerite. He's next in line. And he's got to convince them that he would be fair and the way he does that is to decide to become Catholic. Now, if you know your French history, then you may have heard this phrase that Henry says, Paris is worth a mass. Now, like a lot of these apocryphal statements through history, we don't really think he said it. But the idea is fair. It's, it is what he would have been thinking. That in other words, it's, it's more important for me, Henry, Duke of Bourbon, Duke of Navarre, to gain the support of Paris. And I'll get that by being Catholic, even though personally, I'm going to still want to be a Huguenot, but I'm okay with that. He is what was called at the time, a new term that had emerged called a politique. Now you of course can see from that, we get the word politics. And of course the French aren't the first to use the word politics in that way. But what was meant at this point, remember those pamphleteers that I told you about? There were several that were beginning to raise the question of, should not the leader of the civic society not be there for himself, or in England's case, herself, but for the good of the people? Should they not be thinking for family first, but for people or nation first? This is a brand new concept that, quite honestly, you've not heard anybody say since the time of the Roman Republic, maybe the early Roman Empire. And so Henry IV, and alongside him, Elizabeth, who we met last time, who we're going to spend some more time with, I think, in a couple of weeks, are an example of this politique, this person who sets aside what's best for themselves and their own religion, 
remember with Elizabeth, she probably was more in line with her brother's, you know, reform, you know, 42 articles. And she certainly would have benefited personally by getting married, having three or four children, maintaining her family name. But Elizabeth concluded that's not going to be best for England. I need to go back to her, this very moderate view that my dad had first established. And you know what? I'm just going to be married to England. Well, here in Henry's case, it would have been much more appropriate for him to stay a Protestant, to stay a Huguenot, um, and to kind of, hey, we won, we fought, you know, you were terrible, the massacre at Vassy, the, you know, the, the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day, we're going to get revenge. But Henry's like, yep, you know what? That's not going to be a good idea. That's not going to be good for me or my people. And the people meaning not my family, the Bourbon family, but my people, all of France. So with Henry the Fourth, you have this kind of emergence in the, um, the, the, of France of a new idea. And really, arguably, at the same time with, with Elizabeth, this new idea in, in, in European, Western civilization, maybe world history, of a leader who's not there just because their name's the right name and they're next in line, but because they're going to think wisely. And you can see what he does over the next, say, 20 years before he's assassinated, unfortunately, himself. Assassination is kind of a thing that goes around, apparently, in 1610. Um, that he's going to be a very good leader. And in fact, with Henry, when we study the rise of absolutism, so when I'm doing this in my Western Civ II class with my students and we kind of spend time on absolutism, I start them right here with Henry after he's gained control. And what are some of the things we see him doing? Well, one, he placates the Catholics. He basically says France is a Catholic country. He makes sure the Pope's happy. He makes sure Paris is happy by saying there can be no Protestant churches within five miles of the city. At the same time, he takes care of supporting the moderate Catholics by basically defanging all the counter-reformation. He doesn't um, make illegal the Jesuits, but he basically bans them from most of, of France because he doesn't want that kind of extremist view of, of cat Catholicism. And in the same year, 98, he issues the Edict of Nantes. And so the Edict of Nantes is really one of the first, if not the very first, statement of tolerance. I mean, I guess the Peace of Augsburg is, um, but it's a statement of tolerance in that the, the Huguenots, the, the Protestants of France, would be allowed to exist. They could live in certain cities if they wanted. They could choose to live where they wanted to live. And the cities that they were in, if they were the majority, they could you know, run the government. They could even fortify the cities. Um, they, could, they could guard the cities, they could have their own kind of army to some degree, and have a high degree of independence, which at that time was unheard of. Even in, in, the, in the empire, remember, the decision wasn't that there could be Catholics and Lutherans living together. It was within a certain kingdom, it was one or the other. Well, here, Henry is saying within our kingdom of France, we'll let you kind of coexist generally speaking, as long as you Huguenots recognize you're not the majority, you're the minority. And so this is a very important stage. Now, pause there for just a second to catch my own breath. Come back here to this map. You can see over here is Henry IV. He's not in red. He's not part of the Valois family. But this is the moment that the French crown moves to the Bourbon family. And from here, you can see kind of all the pieces on the, on the map starting to really come out here, um, where the French will stay Catholic, but with a strong Protestant minority in the story. And this is in 1610, of course, he's assassinated. And we'll see next time that that first decade of the 1600s becomes a really vital decade, which puts us on the cusp of um, the final blowout which we will get to, I think, I think in two weeks. I don't think we'll do it next week. I think we'll do two weeks. All right, that's where we're going to stop tonight. Now, you guys have been awesome. Again, I'll pause it. I always do. Nobody's typed a question, which is totally fine. I don't know if anyone wants to ask a question. You don't have to, but I'd just like to give you a quick second if somebody wants to ask a question. It's all, it's all right if you don't. You guys are faithfully listening as always. Well, I look forward to seeing you next Thursday. What we'll do next Thursday, just so you know, is we're going to go back and backtrack to Spain, and we'll focus here. We're going to learn why, if you ever watch the Olympics or the World Cup, why the, uh, the Netherlands is always wearing that bright 
gaudy orange. Why do they do that? What's going on with those guys? And uh, we're, we're going to learn about how that happens in the process. I love being with you guys. I miss being with you in person, but I know we're going to get there. It's going to happen sometime. I think it'll happen this year, and I'm looking forward to making that happen. Maybe this summer even, but until then, we'll keep working together this way. Thank you so much, and uh, have a wonderful night.